I guess it started way early on in our life that we love to hear stories because they would often start with that one line that still gets us even as adults today. At least it does for me. Once upon a time. And so it was in Jack's house. Jack was two years old and he loved it when his daddy would weave stories for him and it always involved a rabbit and it always involved the wolf. And so on this particular occasion, Jack came running out of the kitchen. He'd just gotten down from the the chair and he still had spaghetti stains on his sweatshirt and he went running in to see his dad who was working on a report that he needed to get done for tomorrow and he said, Daddy, I need you to tell me a story. A story with a rabbit and a truck. His dad spun around and said, what did you say, Jack? He said, I want to hear a story with a rabbit and a truck. And so with that, dad stopped what he was doing and he reached down and he picked up Jack and he put him on his lap. And he began to weave this story spontaneously, making it up as he went. It was, it's just got the best image of it. And so as he was weaving the story, it came time uh, to introduce the villain. You know, every story as a child's got that villain who shows up. And so Jack's daddy was telling him, uh, yes, and the rabbit was in the truck. And they were going down the road and everything was fine and then the truck broke down. The rabbit got out of the truck and guess who started to sneak up on the rabbit? About that time, Jack did something he's never done before. He took his finger and he put it up to his daddy's lips and pushed him close and said, No, no bad wolf. (laughs) Jack's daddy backed up and said, But Jack, you you know the wolf always shows up and you know how the story ends. The the rabbit's going to be fine. He's going to live happily ever after. You know the, the rabbit wins, right? This time Jack put his finger on his daddy's lips and pressed him really hard. And in that deep voice of a two-year-old, no big bad wolf, daddy, no. And with that, it was understood from Jack's daddy. He said, well, okay, no big bad wolf. And with that, he weaved the story and it ended. Richard Myers tells that story with this in mind. To remind us that even at the age of two, Jack has become aware of evil in the world. Jack knows about the essence of something that's less than good, something that can bring a kind of a haunting presence into his life, even if it is just through a story. But what Jack also understood was he could put his finger up to his daddy's lips and say, no, no big bad wolf. And just like that, evil was written out of the story. I wish we could do that. I wish we could simply say no big bad wolf and the essence of evil to be gone. It would be so helpful if if that's all we had to do uh, to to make evil go away or pain and suffering and that it would, it's just not a reality. But we know different, don't we? By living this life and even opening the scriptures, we understand that there's a reality. It's a reality of evil. There's a reality of suffering. There's a reality of pain. You don't have to go too far back. It was 9-11 when our nation was brought to its knees. You remember that by this this radical uh, Islamic sect of terrorists who who brought down these buildings. But more than that, took away an innocence, uh, killing 3,000, almost 3,000 people, wounding almost 6,000 more. And it was as if America as a nation wanted to scream, no, no big bad wolf. And yet the reality is that we couldn't speak it out of existence. We've watched it unfold historically in what we know to be called mass shootings of innocent victims. All the way back to 1966, the University of Texas massacre where there someone took a rifle up into the tower and ended up shooting 17 people, numerous others, 31 wounded during a 96-minute rampage with a weapon. It went on to 1999, the the Columbine shooting high school massacre, 12 students, one teacher killed, 21 others wounded. And then we all remember 2007, the Virginia Tech shootings where over 32 students and faculty members killed, over another 30 or so wounded of faculty and students. And then as if it couldn't get any worse, we have the 2012 
Sandy Hook Elementary shooting of 20 first grade children. And we scream from the inside of our hearts and from the depths of our souls, no big bad wolf. And yet it doesn't go away. But it's not just about these mass killings as if that's not enough because evil is not only seen in senseless murders. No, evil really when we break it down is seen anywhere there's humanity and bad decisions are made. Decisions that hurt other people. Decisions that get innocent people hurt when these decisions are made. And even in the midst of that, as if that's not enough when we, scrout no, when we shout no more big bad wolf. No, no, no. We realize there's still pain and suffering in this world because we've been given bodies that aren't made to last forever. And so there's disease. There's pain. We, we deal with the heartache and the suffering of, of seeing people suffer with cancer or Alzheimer's or MS, uh, any of the MD, any of these things that just kind of take away the quality of our life, the joy of our life. And we want so bad to be able to say like Jack did, no more big bad wolf. We want to write it out. And then there is in the midst of the suffering that comes in a world in which We've created things. The story was told in 1963. A 17-year-old asked her parents for the keys to the car. She was going to a party. They let her go. Then they received that phone call just about an hour later they never wanted to get. Your daughter's been involved in a car accident. When they were on their way to the hospital and they got there, the story unfolded. Their daughter, Laura, had gone through an intersection, didn't see the stop sign, T-boned another vehicle, and killed the driver of the other car. It was a young man she not only knew, it was one of her friends. He was a local track school, track, a star athlete in the same school they attended. Laura went on to say that that tragedy shaped her perspective out of her life about compassion and how deeply people can suffer when things, bad things happen. You might be interested to know, Laura Welch went on to become Laura Bush, the wife of the President of the United States. This can be a cruel world. There is a reality in which no one is exempt. Not anyone is exempt. It doesn't matter how much money you make. Money can't keep you, can't keep you from experiencing the big bad, the big, bad wolf in our life in one way or another. It's going to come calling. It doesn't matter if you come from a Christian home. That, that doesn't put a pen around you or some kind of walls that doesn't allow life to happen to you. No, no. Indeed, we can scream, no, no more big bad wolf, all we want to in this world. And yet sinners and saints alike understand and acknowledge what the Bible says is true. There is a wolf loose in this world. Scripture says it. It's a reality. Now the scripture today that's been chosen really is apocalyptic in nature. It's really about what is to happen and yet there's some words for us in it. You heard it. Uh, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars on the earth and nations. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Listen to this. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on in the world. For heavenly bodies will be shaken. Wow. This is certainly uplifting, isn't it, on the first Sunday of Advent. Preachers really painting a wonderful view of this season casting a pall talking about the big bad wolf. And yet I want to suggest to you this is the perfect time to acknowledge the big bad wolf because Advent means coming. And not only that he is going to come again in the second Advent of what this literature is about because it says to us, listen, hope is coming in the second Advent. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory. And when it happens, people, when these things begin to happen, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Well, here's the beauty of all this. The scholars would say that is what is to come. You and I get to live in a world where Jesus already has come. He is here now. We can acknowledge the second advent can't happen until the first advent and it has happened. He has been birthed into our world. So it is all about hope because no matter how heavy the burden of our pain and suffering, no matter how awful the evil is that can be perpetrated either on masses of people or just about individuals, no matter how discouraging the realities of pain and suffering are, here's the reality. We can endure we can make it because He 
in Jesus Christ has overcome. He has come into our world and in his hope, the hope of his existence, we can now take heart in this. This is what we get to live out. And we can take all of our time we want to to shout and, and be angry about no more big bad wolf and point fingers about the evil and all that and miss the opportunity of this season reminding us, yes, but, but wait a minute, Jesus has come and he is in you and he is in me. Let's go be the hope of our world. Jesus has come and is here. He is the answer to the big bad wolf. So let's be reminded about something this Advent season. This season of four Sundays before Christmas, before that day in which we light the Christ candle because Christ, the recognition of his birthday. Let's be clear about something. This is not the season to celebrate Jesus as the satron paint of fourth quarter earnings. This is not the season here about spending money we don't have on things we don't need for people we don't really even like. This is not about perfectly decorating for everybody because family's coming again and we know we can get it right this year because we understand a hundred things may be right, but there's always that person in our family who will not only pick it out, but will show it up that here's the one place we failed. This is not the season about shopping for the perfect gift for somebody because we have in our mind this fantasy that when they open the gift, tears will stream down their face and they'll say, how did you know? It's the perfect gift. How did you know? No, they're going to say, thank you. When are we going to (laughs) eat? But we wrap ourselves up in that when really the cry of our soul is no more big bad wolf. And I'm saying to you that the hope of this season is found in Jesus Christ because he is the answer to that and he is in you and he is in me. So what does that look like? Because this season really is all about gifts and gift giving and I want to suggest to you it is about the gift of giving hope to people. It is that that takes place, for instance, on the James River campus when just a couple of Saturdays ago they loaded up, they unloaded 100 mattresses and had found out that there are children in the city of Richmond who have been sleeping on the floor. They've been sleeping on a mat. And so they took these mattresses and delivered them with sheets and blankets to the kids. Now this is what hope looks like. Hope looks like when they take those beds and mattresses in, it's halfway through the day, the kids are already dressed, they go get undressed and put on their pajamas so they can come dance on those beds and jump up and down. That is hope. Can you say amen? Amen. Hope is when James River Campus does that and speaks hope into the life of someone. When the village campus, very quietly by the back door of the sanctuary, has boxes to collect food because the local nearby elementary school will call when there's a family in need, when somebody's hungry. Listen to what the principal of that school said about the village campus. You are, quote, a beacon of hope. This is what hope looks like when Robius Hall loads up children because they say, we want to go to Sunday school. Hope looks like packing over a thousand shoeboxes that are going to end up all over the world. And when they open them, the toys will be awesome. But that message, God is love, that's how this box got to you to begin with. That is the message of hope, friends. That is how you and I say, no more big bad wolf. That is the reality that speaks it into existence. Because he has come and he's changed my life and he's changed your life. He's changed our lives. This is the gift of hope. And so this season is all about celebrating that hope we have in this relationship with God. The hope in our journey to continue to grow, to become emotionally and spiritually healthy because we're being sanctified. We haven't arrived. We're in process. We're on a journey. It's about the hope we want to breathe into our marriages or into our singleness to say that God is present in our home and in our relationships. It's about the hope of experiencing Advent in a way this way that people will know something is different, that we've not bought into what the world says Christmas is all about, but we serve a Savior, a risen Savior. As a matter of fact, I've told you all about this, this about me. I have this little competitive streak. It's just a little one. It's not big at all. And so there's a part of me, because I have my hope in Jesus Christ, you know what I want to say? Why don't you bring it on, big bad wolf? Because Jesus has overcome. He has overcome. I love the story that was told about the mom whose life really had just, it had just fallen apart. 
single mom with three kids. Her husband had left her. She had just found out her dad had hip surgery in another city. She couldn't afford to go see him. She's trudging home, uh, walking downtown on her way to her apartment. And, and, you know, just that slow, depressing walk if you and I were to see her. She's thinking about what is she going to do. She just found drugs in her 16-year-old's bedroom this week. She's remembering that she lost her composure with patient uh, with a patient at work that day. She then remembers two days ago somebody was carrying a tray of food. She turned around and knocked the tray over and the food went all over a patient. It had just been one of those kinds of weeks and she was getting over the flu, feeling awful. Slowly, methodically, she's walking. She turns the corner and an old stone church is doing a live nativity scene. And she stops. Not really because she's interested, she's just tired. She's catching her breath. And then she begins to take in the different images, but overriding all the visual images is this thing that's coming through in her ear. It's an audio. It's a baby. And the baby's crying. And she knows immediately that's got to be baby Jesus in the nativity scene. And sure enough, she looks over and there's baby Jesus and they're trying to get this baby to calm down. But the more they try to get the baby to calm down, the louder he gets. As a matter of fact, it's just a few seconds in, this baby really starts screaming. And so one of the moms comes in from the side as if to say, give the baby to Granny, I'll take care of it. So they handed over baby Jesus to Granny, and Jesus screamed louder, (laughs) creating havoc in the midst of all this. She looks over and she sees this little boy's mouth moving because he's trying to read the Christmas story on the side. When he finishes, because all she can hear is this baby screaming, when he finishes, then this little angelic choir begins to sing, but they can't even stay on the same page together because everybody's focused on the baby because the baby is creating havoc and she stands there and tears start coming down her cheeks. And then she starts laughing, almost hysterically laughing. It's... It's not laughing at. There is a joy that's coming to her. And somebody says, are you okay? I mean, you've got havoc going on. This baby is screaming, absolutely. And nobody's doing any of their parts right. And she said, yes, look at this. Look at this. That that is actually baby Jesus. He's, He's alive. He's real. He came and he created chaos everywhere he went. He turned people's lives upside down. And you know what that tells me? I've got hope because Jesus came and he was real. God gets it. That's the kind of story that reminds me there is hope. God has a plan. He describes it in Isaiah 61, 11, 6. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child shall lead them. So friends, when we enter into this Advent season and you're feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling burdened and life is crashing in because of pain and suffering and evil, when these things begin to take place, stand up. Lift up your heads because your redemption is not only drawing near, your redemption, my redemption is here. This is how I know this to be true. Sunday school teacher wanted her class to learn, memorize the 23rd Psalm and get up individually in worship and say it. The kids were so excited, they began to learn over a month long the 23rd Psalm. And they were doing so well, but eh, little Ricky was having trouble. Little Ricky really would get in the middle of it and just forget everything. But the day came when each child would have their opportunity in worship to stand up and recite the 23rd Psalm. And sure enough, the first one did it perfectly. The second perfectly. People began to cheer. It was awesome. And then little Ricky got up there. And little Ricky said, The Lord is my shepherd. There was this uncomfortable pause as if he was looking around for the next line. And the next line came. And that's all I need to know. And he went and sat down. Is that all you need to know? Pray with me. (coughs) 
into these moments of silence, O Lord, with the presence of your Holy Spirit begin to echo in the chambers of our heart, our mind, and our soul, bringing with it a sense of hope, of strength, of the knowledge that you are here, you have come. And Lord, this means we have an answer to the big bad wolf. And though there is a reality of that in our life, there's also another reality we choose to live by. And that is the Lord is our shepherd. Father, in these moments, if there's one who's never received you as king of their heart, of their life, if they've never bowed before you and said, Lord, I know that I've sinned against you and I know you paid a price on the cross for me to come live with you forever, I want to receive you now, Jesus, into my life. Perhaps there are those of you who are looking for a a community of faith to join with, to be a part of. And Jesus says, come, I want to be the hope in your life that provides community. Whatever the Lord is dealing with you about, the pain and the suffering in your life, the evil perhaps that has beset you or others that you love, Jesus has come today to say, I'm here. I am alive. I am with you in the midst of the storm. It's your invitation, Lord. It's not mine. But I pray you will help each of us respond now faithfully. In the name of your Son, who is our Savior, His name is Jesus, and He has come.